I am extraordinarily pleased to be here tonight, but I'm, um, I'm afraid I'm more pleased in a sense than y'all are going to be. The, um, the celebratory nature of this evening means that it was a mistake to invite me to come talk. I am a harbinger of gloom and apocalypse. I wrote a book called The End of Nature. Um, um, and in fact, for a moment, we're going to go through the valley. Um, just for a moment. Maybe appropriate for Holy Saturday to do a little of that. Um, I'm going to talk to you about where we are right now with climate change. And I promise that when I am through that, will finish in a little more upbeat fashion. But you know what? There is no sense, even for a moment, sugarcoating the situation that we're in right now. I'm sitting next to Gary Brash at dinner tonight, who's done the most effective job of anybody in the world of documenting for the eye the trouble that we're in. I wrote the first book, as Earl said, about global warming 20 years ago, a book called The End of Nature. At the time, it was a hypothesis, this idea that humans were putting enough carbon into the atmosphere to be materially affecting the climate. I mean, it seemed scientifically sound, but it also seemed emotionally counterintuitive. How could we have grown large enough to actually be altering the climate and with it everything that happened on the surface of the earth? And so right away, you know, after that, science went to work and went to work very hard. Within four or five years, by the mid-1990s, the world's climatologists gathered together by the UN in this intergovernmental panel on climate change that just shared the Nobel Prize with Al Gore, were willing to say that humans were heating up the planet and that it was going to be a serious problem. It was a kind of coming of age moment for us as a species. And the 10 or 12 years that have followed, it's as if the planet itself is conducting a kind of rigorous peer review of this science just to make sure that we got it correct. We've had one warm year after another, all the record warm years. And here's what we've come to realize, and here's what I want you to just take home, because I know you already know all about global warming and understand that it's a problem. And it's a, frankly, it's a great pleasure for me to be in front of an audience where one doesn't have to you know, be persuading people so much about this. What you need to know is that the only thing that's changed in that 20 years is our understanding that the magnitude and the pace of this problem are much larger and much faster than we first understood. Suffice it to say that we got the most profound signal of all last fall when ice across the Arctic melted in ways that no one had foreseen or, or understood was even quite possible. Ice has been melting in the Arctic sea ice for 30 years now because it's been getting warmer and every year a little more is melted and you know it's retreated just slowly, slowly, you know, um, um, like say the hairline of a balding male or some <laughs> such. One way to think about it is that those pictures of the earth that were taken from Apollo 8 the sort of blue marble floating in the black void of space were as out of date as my high school yearbook picture is. You know, the, the, the worth had changed. There was a lot less white and a lot more blue. Last year, last year we went past that old record in the middle of August, okay? And for the next six weeks, we were losing an area of ice the size of California every week. When the long Arctic night finally descended, the beginning of October and things began slowly to refreeze again. The new record was 25% below what we'd ever seen before. The Northwest Passage was open, fully open for the first time, not just in human history, but from far back as you know, we can really measure. That melt scared scientists. People that I've been talking with for 25 years, people like James Hansen from NASA, our greatest climatologist, 
who had been sober and concerned and worried and working hard were all of a sudden a sort of note of almost panic in their voices. Okay? The headline on the front page of the New York Times was rapid melt of Arctic ice shakes scientists. And it's exactly right because along with a dozen other parameters that we could talk about, things were coming back way off the charts. What it made us realize in some way that we never had before was that this was no longer in any way a problem for our children. It was no longer a problem that's a few decades off. It's a problem that's breaking over our head right now. It's not a problem. It's a crisis. It's the biggest thing that human beings have ever managed to do. In December, in December of this year, of last year, we got a number, okay? And I'm only going to ask you to remember one thing tonight, one number, okay? But James Hansen delivered a paper at the American Geophysical Union, their annual meeting in San Francisco, the big physics meeting. And he, his paper said, we now understand from looking at paleo climatic data from looking at history, you know, what we can tell about the history of long history of climate, and from looking at what's happening in the real world, things like this rapid melt of Arctic ice, we now have some sense of what a safe concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is. Before the Industrial Revolution, there were 275 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, okay? What Hansen said was, anything above 350 parts per million, that's the only number I want you to remember, 350. Anything above 350 parts per million takes us out of the safe zone, okay? That was a very profound and upsetting thing to say. And the reason that it's profound and upsetting is because we're already at 385 parts per million. Okay, we're already past it. We're already out of the safe zone. We're already way into dangerous territory. And what he was implying was that our job is to now scramble back as fast as we can. Okay, an enormous task. Not an impossible task. It's like going to the doctor and the doctor says, and I shouldn't say this right before dinner, but the doctor says, your cholesterol is too high, okay? It doesn't mean that you immediately keel over on the floor of the doctor's office and die. It means that you have to get to work. You have to drop that cholesterol level back to some place where you're not likely to have a heart attack or a stroke, okay? It means in the context of cholesterol, that you probably shouldn't eat a lot of cheese, you know, anymore. In the case of the planet, what it means is, what it means is that we have to get to work in very short order on the most difficult set of tasks. What it really means is, as a planet, not cheese, it means as a planet we can't burn coal anymore, okay? We've got to stop, we've got to have a complete moratorium on new coal-fired power plants, and we got to start figuring out how to phase out the rest of them. And unless we can do that quickly around the world, the possibility of ever getting back to that 350 number before we do irrevocable damage seems slight. It is the most, it is the most alarming set of news that we could have gotten. And that's where I'm going to end the depressing part of this talk, okay? <laughs> because now I want to talk about what we're going to do about it and how we're going to do something about it. And I know that I can do that in this room because I know that you guys have already begun to sense what's possible. There is no place in America that's offered more leadership on how we're going to deal with this problem than the state of Oregon and the city of Portland, okay?